How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres referred to the most recent IPCC report as a code red for humanity. But even with such alarm bells ringing, why is it so hard to get people to acknowledge the severity of the situation? Renowned climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe says our collective threat meter is unbalanced. People tend to create psychological distance from risk and naturally avoid thinking of climate change as an imminent personal threat. As an evangelical Christian and preeminent climate science communicator, Heho says she often connects with people through her faith, but she doesn't put up with those who use religion to deny climate science. Despite believing that a negative climate future is likely, Heho says that hope always begins in a dark place. The recent UN assessment report referred to a code red for humanity by UN Secretary General. And yet, in your latest book, you write that the scientific community, because they have to operate by consensus, has, quote, a systematic tendency to underestimate observed changes and their resulting impacts. How concerned, how concerned are you that as scary as the recent assessment is, the reality is even worse? Well, anyone who thinks I'm an optimist needs to read that very carefully because <laughs> as a scientist, we have to be realists and we know that that is the case. We are systematically biased to the direction of underestimating the rate and pace and magnitude of the change, the extent to which it's affecting us and the potential for really nasty surprises in the climate system. But that's why I think the IPCC's conclusion is so powerful. They first said this when they released their 1.5 degree report in 2018, and it still stands just as true today. They said, every action matters, every bit of warming matters, every choice matters. So now more than ever, everything that we do matters. And that is scary, but it also offers some hope. Because as, as my co-author Catherine Wilkinson said, I was one of the contributors to that amazing compendium, All We Can Save, mm. of 60 women's voices on climate. She mm -hmm. said, what an amazing, I'm paraphrasing her exact words, but what an incredible time to be alive when we have the opportunity to truly alter the future of our planet. That is what, that is the responsibility that lies in our hands today. Right, though the UN also warned that even if all the current emissions pledges are fulfilled in Glasgow and for Paris, the world will still warm by 2.7 degrees Celsius. And it's hard to understand what that means. So it's not just that, mm -hmm. that the pledges aren't being fulfilled, that they're not enough to get the job done. That's right. And the pledges have improved. So a year ago, we were at above three degrees. So at least we're now below three, but we're still not at two, let alone one and a half. And that is changing. So I'm from Canada and we just had a federal election in Canada where the, the party in power, the liberals upped their climate commitment. They are now aiming for a 40 to 45% reduction in carbon emissions for the whole country of Canada by 2030, which would actually skate in right at the edge of Canada's contribution to the one and a half degree target. So we are seeing other countries stepping it up, but that's why Glasgow is so important because Glasgow is like a potluck dinner. Every country brings mm. a different dish and they're different. One might be a salad. One might be planting trees. One might be clean energy. One might be a dessert. You know, they're all different. But when you all come together and you bring your dish and you put it on the table, it is painfully obvious and awkward who hasn't brought enough to go around. And that's why these meetings are so important. You know, you know that the parallels in terms of politicization of the response to COVID and climate, they're both collective response uh, challenges. They're both invisible threats. Some are, you know, COVID can kill you directly. Climate can kill someone indirectly. We've been down this road before. How do we get off this politicization? Well, that's exactly how I had to start the book out because here I am writing a book about climate change during COVID and I was watching communication on COVID, on basic things like masks and vaccines, which you might say, this is not rocket science, people. We all have vaccines that we already had when we were children, wearing masks is a very normal thing. 
And I watched it fall right into the same polarization pit as climate change. In fact, mm. one of my favorite cartoons, and I say favorite because you kind of have to have some dark humor sometimes, is a cartoon of two medical professionals standing by a door labeled COVID saying, well, surely if we just tell the facts to the American people, they'll do the right thing. And then you see two scientists by a door labeled climate change who are literally rolling on the ground laughing. People see climate as, as distant, right? But distant threats from government action to curtail the climate as imminent. So, you know, the bad things are happening uh, far away, but the cost and this perhaps sacrifice or inconvenience happen here and now. So let's talk about how people react to that spatial difference. That's, you know, oh, I have to pay something today for a future benefit. Well, psychological distance is one of the biggest barriers we have to understanding why climate change matters to us. We as humans have this built in sense of just sort of pushing risks off. If we see them as being distant in space, happening over there, but not here, distant in time, happening in the future, but not to us, distant in relevance, happening to people who care about that, but not people like me who care about this, and also being abstract, like global average temperature instead of my house being burned down by a wildfire. Mm. Climate change ticks every single one of those boxes. In fact, if you look at the Yale um, Program on Climate Communications uh, public opinion maps, which are just absolutely fascinating, they have the opinion for each county and each congressional district in the United States, and they even have some maps for Canada, and they ask people a series of questions. So as of last year, well over 70% of people said climate is changing, it will affect plants and animals, so non-human species, right, not relevant to me, it will affect future generations, distant in time, it will affect people in developing countries, distant in space, and then they asked, will it affect you, and all of a sudden the number plummets by more than 30%. That is psychological distance, and that is the biggest problem we have. So I know that the dismissives get the most airtime. I know that on social media, I've already seen about 25 of them today, just today alone. I know that on social media and in the comment sections, I know that the people who say climate change is a hoax, they get the most airtime. But they're only 7% of the population. The biggest problem we have is not the people who willfully decide to reject 200 years of basic science, The bigger problem is the number of people who say it's real, but they don't think it matters to them. Because if you you can say, sure, it's real, but if, if it doesn't matter to me, why would I want to fix it? Yeah, that's the disengaged part. And that part has been growing the part of the Yale Six Americas as spectrum. We tend to think of it as a binary. You believe you don't. And you write, it's not a belief. It's a fact. So that disengaged part, there's a there's concern and alarm. But that disengaged part, I think that's right, that there's a lot of people who say, oh, it's the uh, it's the deniers problem. If they would just flip, this thing would open up and be solved. But there's lots of people who are who acknowledge it, who don't deny it, but they're not really taking it into their lives or 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 in to their to their their daily action. I think also one reason people avoid talking about climate because they don't want to engage in conflict. You have all these strategies for connecting with people who disagree and still you receive hate-filled messages from people who don't even know. How do you deal with that? Well, I get these messages every day and like I said, today was a bit on the high side, so I've had at least 25 <laughs> today. Most days I get one or two <laughs> and they come from dismissives. They come from people who my personal definition, which I probably mentioned to you before, Greg, people who if an angel from God with brand new tablets of stone saying global warming is real appeared before them, it would not change their minds. So why would I think I could? So I don't start a conversation to argue. And if somebody argues with me, I respond once. And if they continue to argue rather than using the resources I provided, I'm done. I step out. Because if we begin a conversation by disagreeing over something, It is very rare, it's not impossible, but it is rare for it to end in a positive direction. But here's how we can flip it on its head. If we begin a conversation from the heart rather than the head, if we begin a conversation with something we agree on rather than something we disagree on, if we begin a conversation by esteeming the other person rather than implicitly judging them as so many conversations begin today, that conversation starts off with so much potential and can end in an incredibly surprising place. And in my book, I tell so many stories about these different conversations that have happened in different ways and ended up really in unexpected and incredibly hopeful perspectives and points of agreement. Because when it all comes down to it, we're all humans. We all live here. 
Right. And so one story you, you write about is when you went to a, a Rotary Club in Texas, you know, tell us about that and, and, uh, and what you learned from that story. So I am not a Rotarian, um, but when I walked into, but I'm willing to say yes to you know, any invitation at least once, right? So I was invited to speak to our local Rotary Club for the first time. And I had carefully prepared a presentation that uh, connected with who people were and where they lived. So I talked all about Texas because we all lived in Texas. But I walked in and I see this giant banner, you know, up in the lobby that says the four-way test. Is it the truth? Is it fair? Is it beneficial to all concerned? And I looked at this, I thought, that's climate change. Is it the truth? Yes. Is it fair? Absolutely not. That's why I'm a climate scientist. It's the most profoundly unfair thing and exacerbates all the other injustices too. Would it benefit people to fix it? Yes. So I skipped the buffet lunch. I went and perched on a seat in the corner of the, of the, um, uh, the, the hotel ballroom. I got my laptop and I rearranged my presentation into the four-way test. So I got up there and I could see a few people giving some side eye to the woman who'd invited me. Like, we know what you did there and you're not going to get on this committee again, was what those looks were seeming to say to her. <laughs> and there was a lot of sort of folded arms and leaning back, you know, I'm just going to give her the, you know, I'm going to give her this time because that's what we do, but I'm not going to agree. But then I started in with the four-way test. And so immediately those were th their values and I was esteeming their values so much that I was basing everything I was saying around the test and applying their test to what I had to say. So instead of applying what I had to say to, to them, I was taking their standards and applying them to me. Mm. And I went through the four-way test and I could see, I could see the arms unfolding. I could see, you know, people leaning forward. I could see people even starting to nod. And at the end, I will never forget a local banker who I had met before a couple of times came up to me with the most bemused look on his face. And he said, I never thought too much of that whole global warming thing, which is the very polite Texan way of saying I thought it was a load of crap, but it passed the four-way test. In other words, what can I do? That's my value system. It tested it. It passed. I got to agree. That is the incredible power of starting not with our own values and our own priorities and our own sense of what is right, but recognizing everybody has morals. Everybody has values. Everybody has reasons why they make decisions. And if we take the time to get to know them, most times they are values we can esteem. They are priorities that we can respect. And if we connect climate change to what they already care about, immediately we're talking on their terms, not ours. Tell us about your uncle who dismisses climate disruption and the, make, the mistake you made trying to persuade him. Yes. So when it comes to dismissives, they are only 7 or 8% of the population, according to Tony and Ed Six Americas of Global Warming. But again, we almost all of us have somebody we know who fits into that category, in some cases, more than one person. Usually it's a family member or it could be an old college roommate. It could be somebody we work with. We have someone in our lives. All of us do. In fact, of all the climate scientists I've ever talked to, there was only one person and it was Peter Glick. He's the only person who said he doesn't have somebody in his family who is a dismissive. <laughs> Everybody else says that yeah, He's do. a Berkeley liberal. And, and often these people are highly intelligent. There's a, there's a tendency to, to dismiss these people as stupid, but they are often highly intelligent. Well, that's Dan Cahan's work from Yale. Dan has actually found that the smarter we are, the better we are at motivated reasoning. The better we are at doing, you know, Jonathan Haidt in The Righteous Mind, he talks about how we just, we make up our, our minds based on our, our moral values and our tribes. And then we just go out and look for information to show why we're right. That's why we're using our brains to show that mm -hmm. we're right. Mm -hmm. And so Dan shows that the smarter we are, the better we are at going out and finding the information to justify why we're right. So you're right. It is not an education issue. It is not an intelligence issue. It is entirely an issue of culture. And today in the United States, it is an issue of political identity. So that's the situation that we're in. And your uncle, and, is he a Republican? <laughs> no, no, no. Canadian, Canadian. So, okay. so we have, we have dismissives in Canada too. Yeah. I, I get quite a bit of, of nasty tweets from Saskatchewan and Alberta on a pretty regular basis. Uh, the, tex yeah. the Texas, <laughs> yeah. the Texas of Canada. So, so what yes. mistake did you make trying to persuade your uncle? 
Well, so, so my uncle um, had been having conversations with my dad for quite some time. My dad is a former science teacher himself. And so finally, he sort of got up ahead of steam and decided he was going to email me all his objections. So he emailed me a very long list of objections to do with the basic science because he's a very smart man and he's very educated. So totally fits that profile. And so his, his arguments were couched in, you know, very technical language related to the absorptive properties of, of greenhouse gases and their infrared vibrational and rotational bands and so on. Fortunately, since I'm an atmospheric scientist, I could understand what he was saying. And so <laughs> I made the mistake of replying factually to all of his objections. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, that's a good question because, you know, it is a good question. Even if it was answered 200 years ago, it's still a good question because somebody asked it 200 years ago, right? So that's a good question. And here's the paper that's, that responds to this. And here's this. And here's this answer here. And, you know, I have these little global weirding videos on YouTube. And they sort of explain this in a simpler way if you want sort of a big an overview. So I sent him this detailed email that addressed every single one of his points. And I said, after you've reviewed this, let me know if you have any questions. How many minutes do you think it was until he replied, Greg? <laughs> Not many. Yeah, right on it. Yeah. 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 So so he didn't actually use any of the information I sent him. He just replied immediately with more whack-a-moles. It's like the whack-a-mole game at the fair. As soon as one mole pops up, you whack it on the head with a hammer, and they will keep right. you doing that yeah. ad nauseum. Eight late night comedy shows united recently to address climate on the same evening, including Stephen Colbert, Trevor Noah, and Samantha B. You were featured on Jimmy Kimmel Live, which began with this. Global warming. It's not global warming. It's God's judgment coming to this country. Environmentalism has become a radical movement, something we call the Green Dragon. Scientists from the pits of hell, how dare you take from Yahweh the sovereign right over the weather? When I was six or something like that, I opened up a birthday present that I didn't like. And the person that gave me the gift was there. And, you know, I just crushed that person. And you think, well, that's kind of how we're treating God when he's given us these gifts of, of abundant and inexpensive fuel sources. Right. God's buried those treasures there because he loves to see us find them. We were put on this earth as creatures of God to have dominion over the earth for our benefit, not for the earth's benefit. That was Reverend Jim Baker, Janet Parshall, Pastor Shane Vaughn, Calvin Beisner, and Senator Rick Santorum. Catherine Hayhoe, as a devout Christian, what did you think when you heard those quotes invoking God dismissing climate reality? I thought they haven't read the Bible because that's not what the Bible says. Yeah, it often gets, and what does the Bible say that, that you think they misquoted there? Well, first of all, in Genesis 1, chapter 1, which is the very beginning of the Bible and the Torah, it says that God gave humans responsibility, and the old-fashioned word is dominion, mm -hmm. over every living thing on this planet. And the word, that same Hebrew word, it's actually a Hebrew word that says rada, and you, and you look for where else it's used, and in other places it's used to denote a ruler who cares for the needy and the helpless who watches out for those who are marginalized, who takes care of them and lifts them up. So it's very clearly not about raping and pillaging. It's very clearly about being responsible for, being a good steward for, um, caretaking. So it's not, we didn't, we weren't given dominion for us. It says we were given dominion for the other living things, which of course include humans as well. And then at the very end of the Bible, it literally says God will destroy those who destroy the earth. And in between all the way through, it's all about caring for the most in seemingly insignificant aspects of creation, the lilies of the field, you know, the birds and the butterflies, the least of these, the young children, the poorest and most vulnerable, the orphans and the widows who in those days had no protector. So honestly, if people truly took the Bible seriously, they would be out at the front of the line demanding climate action instead of using it as some type of palatable window dressing for their denial, which has nothing to do with theology and everything to do with political ideology. They don't want to fix it. You also are now the recently the new chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy. A Bloomberg story last year had this title, quote, how the Nature Conservancy, the world's biggest environmental group, became a dealer of meaningless carbon offsets. It chronicled how J.P. Morgan, Disney, and BlackRock invested in forests to offset their carbon 
corporate carbon footprint, but the forests were already protected by the Nature Conservancy and not in danger of releasing their stored carbon. TNC was effectively enabling corporate greenwashing. This was before you were there, uh, a couple months before you arrived. As a person devoted to facts and science, what are you doing to ensure such hollow measures don't happen again at the Nature Conservancy? Well, I absolutely am devoted to facts and science. And so I saw that article before I, before I uh, joined the Nature Conservancy. And that has definitely been the topic of discussions, which have showed, as you probably know, Greg, there's always two sides. And in that case, of course, we need to be more rigorous with our carbon uh, credits. Because first of all, carbon in ecosystems in the soil is a good thing. And there's a hundred times more carbon there than we humans have put into the atmosphere since the dawn of the industrial era. So the concept of conserving, restoring, protecting, and in some cases replanting ecosystems to take carbon up from the atmosphere or to prevent it from being released, that concept is a valid concept. And it's a really important concept that's going to help us get to net zero. There's no way to get to net zero without that. But at the same time, you definitely want to avoid you know, getting credit for something you're already doing. But in the case of that Bloomberg article, there were, there were some things on the other side that that reporter did not want to consider because he had a story to write in an ax to grind. And unfortunately, and I talk about this in the book, the hardest chapter for me to write, but I think the most unusual one for me to write was the one on guilt. Mm -hmm. The fact that when we are people who have cared passionately about the environment for years, we have a certain perspective on the way it must happen, the way climate solutions must be. And so we have what Rebecca Huntley, who's an Australian scientist who wrote a great book about talking about climate change last year, we have what she calls a Puritan ethos <laughs> of sacrifice and purity when it comes to issues like climate change. We have a new 10, you know, 10 green commandments, thou shalt always do these 10 things and heaven forbid you ever consider not doing one of those or only doing them halfway, according to my measures, because I will turn on you with more vitriol than I reserve for climate dismissives if you do so. Mm. And it's very ironic because Greg, this very morning, Oxfam America, who I serve as a sister of the planet, and they are an awesome organization, of course, that work with women and children in low-income countries around the world, and they care passionately about justice and climate change. They pulled an excerpt from my book to post online, and they decided to pull an excerpt on guilt, on how we are always judging each other for not living up to the standards that we set. And as a result, no one wants to do anything because you just get judged. So I posted that on Twitter. I said, you're going to be surprised, but I think one of the biggest uh, barriers to climate action is guilt. And I posted that. Well, guess what happened? Not, not from people who read that tweet, from people who just saw me appear on social media. I got um, guilted and I counted between, between when I posted that and between 11 a.m., which was the last time I saw, I got guilted 12 times. This, this is what I call the, the purity police. They're on you. Totally. Right? The purity police is after you. I, I got guilted for um, writing a book. I got guilted for talking about climate change too much. I get guilted for smiling too much. I get guilted for being doomer too much. I get guilted for what they think I do or don't eat and what they think I do or don't plant and what they think I do or don't drive. They never stop to ask. They just automatically guilt. And I mean, I can tell you, none of those 12 guiltings made me feel anywhere near remotely like doing more of what they thought I should be doing. It made me feel like digging my in my heels and do less. The well, this is exactly what the fossil fuel companies love, because the more people are sniping and judging and sneering at each other, you're not vegan, oh, you fly, oh, you do that, uh, the more that pits us against each other, and uh, rather than fo focusing on the concentration of power and the systems and the real things that need to change, right? So we're playing right into their playbook. We are. And you know what? They are pushing advertising into our social media feeds, actually saying this. They're still doing it. They're saying, what are you doing to reduce your carbon emissions? Are you driving an electric vehicle? Are you putting solar panels on your home? Have you stopped flying? I said, 
I am holding you personally responsible for 2% of global carbon emissions since the dawn of the industrial era, more than the entire country of Canada. And when you have dealt with that, I'm very happy to discuss what I'm doing in my personal life. Yeah, it's like it's a it blame shifting. It, it plays right into we lately a lot of people have recognized that BP actually popularized the personal carbon footprint concept and calculator. So we're playing right into that. Well, as we get to the end here, your hope seems to be authentic. Um, and I'm wondering though, sometimes let's be honest that the climate is going to continue to change during our lifetime. Um, it's going to continue to get darker, the science tells us there's already a lot of momentum built up in the system. So how do you acknowledge that it's going to get worse during our lifetimes, we can do a lot to reduce the harm, and still maintain that hope? Do you have to like, do you embrace that inevitability, that darkness to get through to genuine hope? You have to. What I've learned is that whether you go to theology, philosophy, psychology, or science, Hope begins in a dark place. Mm. Hope begins with acknowledging just how bad it is. We're not talking about a sort of a Pollyanna hope or a bury your head in the sand hope or a cultivate a positive attitude and everything will work out okay hope. We're talking about real hope, muscular hope, rational hope. It begins by looking our crisis right in the face and recognizing it is really bad. And as we talked about at the beginning, it's probably worse than scientists say. And there is no guarantee of a positive outcome. In fact, a negative outcome is more likely than a positive one. But hope is that faint, small, bright light at the end of the dark tunnel that we head for with all our might and all our strength. And when we get dragged down, when we get discouraged, when we get anxious and depressed, and believe me, that happens to me too. We take a breath. We fix our eyes on that hope by going out and looking for what someone else is doing or by making a choice to do something myself. And then we pick ourselves up and we keep on going because what is at stake is too valuable to lose. It's not our planet itself. It will orbit the sun long after we're gone. What's at stake is literally us. So I, I think of Christiana Figueres, who of course shepherded the Paris Agreement. If anybody could be hopeless and despondent and frustrated, it's her. Yet she wrote this amazing hopeful book of what our lives would look like by 2030 with climate impacts. But if we had transitioned to clean energy, walkable cities, clean air, cheap electricity, ample food for all. And she said, look at this amazing vision of the future. The biggest lesson we learned in 2030, looking back, was that we were only ever as doomed as we believed ourselves to be. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you get your pods. Talking about climate can be hard, but it also can be encouraging and uplifting, as you've seen today. So please help us get more people talking about climate by giving us a rating review and sharing the pod and this video with your friends. It really does help. Thanks for joining us online. And Catherine, Catherine Hayo, thank you again for sharing so much of your dynamic, insightful insights on Climate One. Thank you for having me, Greg. Mm -hmm.